Thank you, everyone. So just to remind how lucky we are to be here and having fun doing our the job we like, the business in the nice Montreal. Last year, the same time, but not the same time, during the convention, it was February. It was minus 30 outside, so we, uh, we had some pressure to move up uh, the event in March, where normally in March is 10 or 20 at this time in Quebec. And uh, too bad we have snow and it's still a little bit cold, but Montreal remains Montreal, so do enjoy Montreal. I would like to introduce you our moderator since four years now. It's a permanent contract for the same salary every year. Mr. Yann de la Roche, who is a PhD and former president of Foreign Tech uh, Canada Corporation. He has subsequently assumed the responsibility at Ferric and Paprican when they merge also the three national institutes uh, at, to FP Innovations. And he, he stopped this job in uh, 2009. He's now Dr. De La Roche, uh, John Professor at the University of British Columbia at the Department of uh, Forest Resource Management. Please welcome Yann De La Roche. Thank you. Merci, Sylvain, pour ta chaleureuse présentation et aussi pour de me donner encore cette année l'opportunité d'amener le séminaire du bois uh, de l'industrie. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the kickoff of this year's uh, Montreal Wood Convention. The industry seminars continue to be a marquee event at the Montreal Wood Convention. Over the last three years, we've been fortunate to have a series of great speakers that have spoken on the key issues affecting the wood product sector. And this year's program continues in that fine tradition. One of the things that really struck me over the years is that the organizers have been very capable of bringing together a group of spe speakers that have an interwinding message. And we have the same thing today when you look at our, our, our speakers. Uh, we have Brendan Lowney, who will share with us the Forest Economic Advisors Outlook in the North American wood products market. Christian Dussard will be speaking about market strategies with particular emphasis on the social media to build perceived value in a commodity product. And finally, we'll hear from Carl Grenier, who will give us his perspective on the softwood lumber trade between Canada and the United States and how we can better manage this relationship and mitigate the threats going forward. And you'll see as the talks progress that there is some common themes and interaction amongst all three. And I commend the organizers for putting together uh, these three renowned experts in their respective fields. However, before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to recognize the organizing or, or organizers of this convention. You heard uh, uh, Sylvain Labbé, who is the president and CEO of the Quebec Wood Export Bureau, who's a very key leader amongst the partners. André Tremblay, who is the president and CEO of the Quebec Forest Industry Council. Edward McCulley, who is the interim CEO of the Maritime Lumber Bureau. Jamie Lim, who is the president and CEO of the Ontario Forest Industries Association. Let's give them a hand for a job well done. <laughs> you know what's amazing about this event is the convention here grows bigger and gets better every year. Uh, looking at the registration, we're expecting about 750 delegates this year. We have close to 100 exhibitors, and truly we've become the largest and most effective networking venue for wood product manufacturers, their suppliers, and their customers. However, this event wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the generosity of our sponsors, and we'll be formally acknowledging their much appreciated support throughout the two-day event. Now I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Brendan Lowney. Brendan is a principal at the Forest Economic Advisors, which is, as you all know, a premier source for wood product analysis. Brendan has the uh, big job of interpreting the forecasts in both North America and the uh, uh, international economic landscape, uh, and that forms the basis for the FEA's coverage of the key end use markets in North America. Brendan also writes FEA's microeconomic advisor, and he's a contributing editor 
to FEA's quarterly forecasting service publication. He earned his master's degree in economics from Boston College and holds a bachelor's in mathematics and economics from Union College in Schenectady, New York. The title of his presentation is Housing and Lumber Market Rebound. It'll be strong, but not eminent. Welcome, please, Brendan, to the podium. Good morning, everyone. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, I, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me up here. It's uh, just a, a short, quick five-hour drive um, through Vermont. It was very nice. And I want to get up here for the last year before you know, Trump builds the wall and I won't be able to <laughs> drive up anymore. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, Ian said he's going to talk, ask me to talk about the trade dispute. And I said, well, we have one scenario. Our most optimistic scenario is that Trump does get elected and does build the wall, but he builds it out of wood. So that's the one, <laughs> that's the one we're going for. So. Um, some of my key topics today, I'm going to talk about the macro unemployment uh, fundamentals for the U.S. principally. Uh, I'll talk about Canada a bit. Uh, as, as all of you know, that the, the U.S. housing sector is really the straw that stirs the drink for the industry. We've been eagerly awaiting a return to the, to the underlying demand of 1.5 million housing starts, and when that does happen, uh, it's going to have profound implications for the industry, most of which will be positive. Uh, I'm going to talk about that housing recovery, where we are, where we're going. And then I'm going to get into some of the lumber supply and demand fundamentals, some short-term comments, and then some talk, talk about um, timber supply. Where's that fire we're going to come from? And just long-term outlook for lumber prices. Um, you know, I, I want to keep this as conversational as possible. Uh, we have a small enough group here that if someone wants to raise an objection, raise their hand, or ask a question. I think to the extent that we can make this interactive, that would be more interesting for everybody. <laughs> um, I tend to, I have a lot of slides, but I don't really focus on them. I want to talk. The slides are like wallpaper. I'll go into detail on a few, but generally speaking, they're just to, to, to um, you know, serve as a, as a backup for, for, for my discussion today. So uh, on that note, Let's get started and just talk kind of about the, the overall macro environment. Um, back, you know, if I'd been given this talk in December, I would have been talking about uh, an environment of heightened fear, uh, widespread discussion of a, of a recession in the, U in the global economy, but also in the U.S. economy. And so we, we look at a number of different um, uh, financial market indicators, credit spreads, and so forth. Um, that measure this uncertainty. And one of the best is the so-called fear gauge. It's the VIX volatility index. And you can see surges up in December, and it's really come down substantially since. I mean, the U.S. is looking like it's on track for about 2.5% growth in the first quarter and, and, and decent, if unspectacular, growth uh, going forward. So um, we think there's very, very low risk of a recession in the U.S. in the, in the near term which is obviously a positive development. Uh, huge driver in our industry has uh, uh, been oil prices. So um, as many of you know, that the Canadian dollar tracks oil prices quite closely. And uh, you know, we've seen a plunge in oil prices since, since the middle of 14. So this has had numerous effects. It hasn't been as beneficial for the U.S. economy as we thought it would and many thought it would. It's added about 0.5% to GDP growth. But unfortunately, the collapse in oil investment has subtracted about 0.3% from GDP growth. This is for 15. So net, it's, it's a slight positive. But of course, the, the big impact is on the Canadian dollar. It's a huge impact for this industry. So um, if we look at inflation adjusted, uh, oil prices, this is black line, we track it with the U.S. dollar, Canadian dollar relationship, <laughs> you can see very, very tight correlation. So you know, Canadian dollar goes below 70 cents when oil is at $28 a barrel. So it's since rebounded to about $40 a barrel. The Canadian dollar has since rebounded to about 76 cents. So 
our base forecast assumes it's going to stay in the low, mid to low 70s over the rest of the year. So, and that's, um, you know, if we're wrong, if it, if it goes higher, the, uh, the, the kind of um, fundamental level where quote unquote should be is that green line, the purchasing power parity uh, rate, and that's about in the low 80s, 81, 82 cents, uh, depending on who's doing the calculations. So that's kind of the fair value of the currency by, by that measure. So, um, so what does that mean? If we look at 13, when, when the, the dollar is at about parity, you could see that the, the Canadian producers, well, particularly uh, the Eastern Canadians in Ontario and Quebec are the, clearly the high cost producers. And over the last two years, from 13 to 15, these are, these are, this is data, this is average variable cost. It's from our annual cost survey that we do. And you could see radical change in the cost structure of the industry with, with Quebec and, and Ontario really coming down, becoming much, much more competitive. This is almost all um, the primary driver of variable wood cost, uh, excuse me, variable cost for lumber are wood, the wood cost, the fiber cost. And this is almost all exchange rate driven. So. Um, this changes the dynamics of, of, of the industry. It changes the dynamics of, um, you know, the softwood lumber uh, dispute uh, discussions. So it has huge implications. Going forward, we expect both oil prices and the Canadian dollar to, to strengthen, but very gradually, particularly the Canadian dollar. Um, so on, on some of the mega trends affecting the U.S. economy, uh, we know we had a big global financial crisis, but there were there are some underlying issues that, that, that um, would have augured for a slowdown in the U.S. anyway. So this, this chart shows that the, the, the prime age working population in the U.S. The take home point is it, it was really declining over most of the last six, seven, eight years and it's just started to grow again. Employment growth, because this is all leading up to a discussion of what's going to happen with housing. If we want to know what's going to happen with housing, we need to know what's going to happen with household formation. And that's really driven by population growth and the employment situation. So the U.S. added 2.8 million jobs last year. That's the best figure since the late 90s boom. It's the second year in a row we've had uh, very strong employment growth. The unemployment rate is now below 5%. By and large, the, the, the employment sector is, has been strong. And this, this, this bodes well for household formation and housing going forward. Um, the quality of those jobs is much improved. So this, this is a chart that so we, we go back in time to the, the month before the recession started and we look at the change in full-time employment and part-time. And you can see during the recession the U.S. lost about 11 million full-time positions. So now um, you can see that part-time growth, uh, job growth has been fairly flat or employment's been flat, and you see a very strong and uh, increased um, trend in full-time employment. So the quality of the jobs is, has been good. The $64,000 question is, when are wages going to increase? We're seeing some preliminary signs of, of stronger wage growth, but um, really that, that's the missing piece of the, of, the, um, of the puzzle, and that's one of the main reasons why housing starts and continue to disappoint. Another factor is we have this really nice employment situation, but productivity growth is down. So what that means is we're likely to have disappointing GDP growth going forward. So instead of 3 or even 4% growth, which one would expect coming out of a deep recession from which we never really had a strong bounce back, the so-called dead cat bounce, um, you know, we're looking at 2 to 2.5% 2 GDP growth. That's kind of a realistic expectation in light of population growth and these productivity trends. So that, that's kind of my comments on, on the U.S. macro. Canadian uh, economy, uh, um, you know, that it, it's been hurt by its, well, we've, we're seeing a, a, a shift. Uh, the export sector obviously is more competitive. Manufacturing is much more competitive, but we're seeing pressures on, on some of the domestic sector um, and we're, we've, <laughs> we've been calling for a correction in the Canadian housing market for a number of years and uh, that hasn't materialized yet. 
That is certainly a downside risk. Housing starts have been at 190 to 200 for, 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 for several years now. We think they should be, uh, you know, the underlying demand is about 175, and so then they've overshot. Uh, home prices in Canada obviously elevated by pretty much every, every um, metric. So going forward, we, we, we are not overly optimistic that, that the Canadian housing sector is going to continue to drive growth. But, you know, um, at the peak of or the depth of the recession, Canada, which has 9, 10% of North America's population, was producing 25% of North America's housing stock. Uh, basically, our forecast shows it returning to 9 or 10% of North America's housing starts, and perhaps a little lower. So, these are a quick overview of you know, a continued increase in U.S. housing starts. Um, it's, it's fairly gradual. And again, we, we don't get back to that trend growth of 1.5% for the next couple of years. But let me, let's get into some detail on this. Another way of looking at it is this red line is actual U.S. housing starts, okay? And the green line is our estimate of underlying demand. We take, we look at the U.S. population by age cohort. We look at their propensity to form new households. We look at things such as uh, removals, um, temporary uh, housing de uh, demand for mobile homes, and we come up with a figure of, of an underlying demand. And over time, if we go back to even the late 50s, the area over the green line and the area under the green line generally match up. And then we, we're, we're roughly in balance. We get to the mid-90s, and the U.S. housing market's in balance. I mean, you, you move around the cycle, but um, then we start to get a pretty long period of an overbuild from 95 to, to, to really 2005, 2006. And by 2006, the U.S. housing market's overbuilt relative to underlying demand to the tune of about 2 million units. Since then, we have a huge and prolonged plunge. So that area under the curve is what we, we would call pent-up demand. So the U.S. works off the overbuild and then proceeds to, uh, you know, continue to, 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 um, to, to, to produce housing at a very, very low rate. So at this point, that pent-up demand, that number is about 3 million units. The U.S. is underbuilt relative to underlying demand by 3 million units. And this assumes some fairly conservative assumptions on the demographic side. Um, so that's kind of where we are. And, and Another thing, I, it's not by any means scientific, but um, you know, people think this 1.5 million number is, ah, that's crazy, we'll never get back there because of where we've been. If we look at housing starts between 1959 and uh, 2000, they average 1.54 million. Um, that's with a population, granted a younger population, but a much smaller population. So back in the... Back in the 60s, the U.S. population was 120 million, less than it is now, back when I was born in the late 60s. So um, that 1.5 million number is coming. It's the timing that's problematic. Um, some of the other fundamentals are re have really improved tremendously. So uh, home inventory has been worked off. So there's a tremendous overhang of home, home inventories. This is existing home inventories measured by months of... Uh, the current sales pace, we're kind of back to uh, you know the long-term rate. Home prices have corrected; they're pretty much near fundamental value. If we want to look at price to rent ratio, basically you need about uh, 16 years of rent to purchase a house. 15, 16. That's right in line with long-term trends and a vast improvement over over where we were. So, the calculus for an individual looking to buy or rent, uh, it's, it's certainly a good deal to buy, and that, that's going to bode well going forward. And the demographic trends are positive. So the baby boom is the generation that everyone talks about. One fact about them is they're a little bit younger than most people think, but you know, <laughs> they're not that young, but they're younger than most people think. And the other is that they're, they, they're baby boom, if you go, if you, if you go by... Um, the baby, the millennial generation is larger. Now, 
This, there's different, the, the baby boom is eight, an 18 year generation, the millennial is shorter, but if you adjust for that, by every stretch, the baby boom is larger. So if we look at the US population by age, the two ages that have the most people are 24 and 25 right now, okay? So if we look at this key 30, 25 to 34 year old age cohort, it came down, it's coming back up and it's gonna be uh, well over, um, well over, so if the bo let's put this, when the boomers went through this, hits a peak of about 44 million in 1989, 1990. And we're going to go well above that trend over the next couple of years. So this baby, this key 25 to 34 year old age cohort's grown. So we've got decent economic growth. We've got a lot of the fundamentals have, have improved and corrected. And yet I'm going to tell you that we're still going to have a fairly uh, rough ride back to that 150. And there are a number of factors that are going to suppress housing starts relative to that level over the next couple of years. So the trend is upward, but it's going to be um, kind of a, a long path back, another couple of years at least. So some of the, the main, the single indicator that we look at for to gauge near-term housing start demand is new single family home sales. So we can take that number and we, we can say, okay, well, a certain percentage of homes have started on built, and a certain um, percentage of homes are built by owners and never put up for sale. And, and we know these, these are stable relationships. Certain percentage are going to be single family, not multifamily. We do a little math and, and basically where we've been at about 500,000 uh, new home sales a month, well, that only correlates to about 1.1 million housing starts. With inventory building, we'll call it 1.15. It, it's, it's a low number. So we, for our forecast to be true, for us to even get to this 123, 125 number that we're looking at for this year, we need to see this new single family home sales march up closer to 600,000. So that's the one to look at. This is the single most important thing to look at, okay? Um, now household formations, they're extremely important. Theoretically, this is the concept to look at. It's great. The problem is the data is terrible. The data is wonderful. Once every 10 years, we get great data. Great. In between, the Census Bureau has two divisions that put together estimates of household formation. That's the number of households. It's just a change in the number of households. We got one group of folks, they count people. How many heads of household are there? We got another group of folks who count structures. <laughs> and they should be the same, but they're not. It's about, it's, the level of difference is about 7 million. Over time, though, we do know some things. There are some stable relationships. Over time, the U.S. population grows by 2.5 to 3 million every year. And over time, smoothed out, the U.S. produces about 1.2 to 1.3 million new households a year. And those, those stable lines there show long-term averages. Okay? Um, these things, so the average is the same, but they don't always move together. They have moved together over the last two years. Very disappointing. Household formations in 14, very nice household formations in 15, above trend. The problem is the folks who are forming the households. The problem from the perspective of folks who are selling wood and building homes. The vast majority in the last year of new household formations, whether you looked at, no matter which survey you looked at, were formed by older folks. And they're going to tend to have, um, you know, New homes are going to tend to be in denser, um, you know, den denser living arrangements and use less wood. So this is a key thing to look at. We know the 25 to 34 year old age cohort is growing. It's the we know their employment prospects and outcomes are gradually improving. These are the folks that need to drive housing demand, not not the old, not the older folks. Another issue is inequality in the U.S. So. Um, Let's just look at some trends. The, a, the average, average, the mean income growth has been pretty good. That's the blue line. It's household income growth, the average. So since 2000, it's, if, we, if we set January of 2000 equal to 100, basically we've had a 20% increase, which is great. <laughs> the problem is it's not flowing down to 
the median household. So median household is that household where half the households are in more and the other half are in less. And we, there's two ways to look at this slide. One is basically right now the U.S. median household income is right where it was in inflation adjusted terms back in 2000. That's the bad news. The good news is the recent trend. And that, we think, uh, is going to bode well for, for, for single-family uh, construction and just, just um, housing starts in general, is when the average person with average credit can, can afford to buy a home and is, is, is confident enough to do so. Um, and this is where the credit piece comes in. Credit has been a constraint in, in the U.S. Credit standards were about right in the 90s. They were way too loose for the first part of the, the 2000s, and they've been too tight since then. So if we look at this data shows a weighted average credit score of, of folks getting a mortgage. Um, it's backed by Fannie Mae, and you could see uh, that the average credit score bumped up. You know, lower is better. An average credit score typical person should be about 700 or 710 or so. And the number of homes um, going, of being, uh, mortgages going to people with credit scores or below 700 has, is really much weaker than it used to be. Credit needs to ease. Uh, other measures show credit easing, but no measure shows it um, easing by enough to compensate for the extreme tightening that we've seen over the last couple of years. Another huge issue that we hear anecdotally and, and every year the din gets louder is supply side shortages. So folks say to us, if I can snap my fingers and the demand is there for 1.6 million housing starts, 2 million housing starts and demand, the supply side can't accommodate that. And that makes sense to us. So um, this is, a, this is a, from a survey from the National Association of Home Builders. You can see that the percent of builders reporting labor availability issues and, and land availability issues, it's increased every year. 68% for the former, 57% for the latter. Wall Street Journal just had a good story two weeks ago about how the state permitting agencies uh, are, are, are understaffed and they can't get the permits out in time. So um, this is true all throughout the supply chain. Time and money is going to solve a lot of these issues particularly on the builder side. We look at this on the logging side, and that's, it's going to be more of a, uh, an issue. Uh, the average age of a truck driver in, in 2008 out in the Pacific Northwest, a log truck, west, a log truck driver was 55. Folks are aging out, and they've been, they've been kind of transitioned out of the industry. So uh, on the logging side, the economics of it, there's a lot of contract loggers. It's very expensive to get a logging operation going. Uh, things need to change in, in the way that a lot of big uh, uh, manufacturers uh, deal with um, the logging, their logging supply issue. Transportation was a big issue prior to the collapse in oil prices, particularly in the U.S. South on the west side. They were just losing workers in manufacturing and transportation to the oil sector. That's kind of ameliorated a bit. So look out for supply side issues. That's just yet another reason why we're not going to get that huge hockey stick run-up in, in housing starts. It's just not going to happen. Some other, um, other topics in housing that we think are interesting, we think you folks might too. A single family share is way down, okay? It's going to increase for, for a number of reasons, but it's going to remain well below that 30-year average of 76%. So um, why do we care? Well, a single family home uses about three times as much wood as a multifamily home. That, that's the main reason we care. Um, folks, you know, the, folks look at what's going on in the northeast of the U.S. in California, and they see plunging single-family share, and extrapolate that to the rest of the country. Because, I mean, where is the media in the U.S. focused? Northeast, California, and they 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 see you know this never-ending gloom for single-family sh share. And you know, I would throw a couple caveats um, that uh, that argue. They also point out that, you know, these tw this is that, what I talked about, these 24 to 25-year-olds, soon to be 28, 29, 30, they tend to move into dense housing, then single-family housing. So near term, the economics of, or, or the, the demographics favor multifamily homes. But it's important to know, one, California and the Northeast Census region combined 
They've produced 18% of U.S. housing starts in the last five years. More than 50% of U.S. homes are built in the South. In the South, they tend to have higher shares of single-family homes, fewer zoning restrictions, more land. So this is a chart. You can see the populations moving south and west, particularly the inland west, and you tend to have a higher uh, share. Of, uh, let me go back one. This is, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of as we get out to 2020 and we look at the projected population by age cohort, you can see that 25 to 34-year age cohort. There's a lot of these folks. So even though they're tending to live at home with mommy later, <laughs> even though they have student loan debt, which is an issue we think is a bit overrated, uh, there's a lot of these folks. It really bodes well for, 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 for household formation in the future. So, of course, new residential construction is a huge end-use market. R&R expenditures or improvement expenditures are the second most important. It's huge. Again, uh, the data on that, we don't have as much data as we have on a new home construction. That's, that's been an issue. The, 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 the government's main statistics were just recently dramatically revised after, <laughs> after they noticed, after six months of us calling them, they noticed a co computation error, us and others, I assume. But the fundamentals for R&R &R markets are also very solid. So let's look at this, this data from the Census Bureau back in... 2013, the average, the median rather, the median owner-occupied home was 37 years old, which is 10 years older than it was back in 1993. So I had a full head of hair back in 1993, <laughs> too. Um, so that bodes well. There's a lot of pent-up demand. We have increasing home equity. So the, the U.S. home equity, total home equity is now higher than it was uh, pre-recession. We have uh, rising income growth. It really bodes well for for R and R expenditures, and you can see just you know we have a run up in, in in 2005. A lot of that's driven by easy credit, home equity lines, people using their home as an AT, ATM, and we show it getting back to the long term trend, pre bubble trend, only by 2020. So the trend is up, but you know the levels uh, fairly conservative. So we feel pretty good about that. Right. So now some kind of transition. So we've set the stage with the macro outlook, the housing outlook. Let's talk a little bit about uh, lumber. So near term, prices are up. <laughs> That's the good news. Yay. Um, they've done really well uh, the last several months. Um, but a lot of this is just seasonal buying. Uh, we, we expect that lumber prices have, will likely peak sometime, you know, April or so, and then trend down uh, over the rest of the year. On a smooth basis, we think we're going to look back in, in that 2015, 2016 period, particularly 15, is going to look at the bottom of the, of the lumber cycle. But from a near-term basis going forward, you know, the expectation is that prices will start to decline in the next couple of weeks. Why? Well, one, inventories are really high. So this is our inventory uh, to consumption ratio. Two, it always happens. <laughs> it doesn't always happen, but historically prices fall in the second, uh, start falling in the second quarter. This is a typical season pattern, seasonal pattern. Three, there's a lot of capacity coming online. Uh, so I'm not going to go through each of these mills individually, but you have Western Canadian uh, capacity coming online. You have Ontario production capacity coming online. And you have U.S. production capacity. Combined with, um, you know, not a robust near-term housing scenario. Increasing to be sure, but not a robust. So that's going to put some downward pressure on lumber prices. Longer term, though, in the context of, of um, you know, a, a broader you know, long-term perspective, we still show a ramp up in U.S. lumber consumption, primarily driven, mostly driven by Let's say driven by U.S. residential construction, both um, new residential and R and R. So that's our that's kind of our loan. We have a increase in consumption, but kind of begs the question: <laughs> Well, where are we going to get the wood, and uh, where are we going to get the fiber? And uh, so, and and the question is: uh, It's not 
that easily answered. If we, if we say, is it going to come from Canada, uh, the answer is not likely. I mean, if we look at Canadian lumber production all right, relative to previous peaks, so the solid lines of previous peaks, this slide just breaks out British Columbia and then other Canada. You could see that you know, even going forward with that uh, increase in production, uh, we don't get back to where we were um, from, from a perspective of Canadian production. Why? Well, everyone kind of knows the story, I think, with British Columbia. The mountain pine beetle has really decimated a lot of the, 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 um, the resource in the interior of BC. You can, but in, so these blue circles, these are mills. This is from our, our sawmill capacity database. The issue is where the wood is killed is right kind of where the mills are. So and this slide shows that. Basically, 75% of BC's lumber capacity is, is facing a major decline in, in supply. And so we, we have an extensive report on this. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, you know, the wood can be used for eight years easily, no problem. Uh, after it's dead, and then between 8 and 12, it can be used depending on what the price is. But after 12 years, it's very difficult to use that wood. And we're coming into a period of time where a lot of this resource is more than 12 years dead. Very, it'll be very difficult to use. So um, if we look at kind of on a provincial basis, uh, the, blue, the blue bar here being um, the average annual uh, cut, excuse me, uh, average allowable cut, and the harvest levels, you can see we're actually pretty close to the average annual cut for a lot of provinces. Um, you know, in eastern Canada, principally Quebec, uh, the economics of the industry is changing uh, in tandem with the secular decline in newsprint. So newsprint production in North America is down 55% over the last 10 years. For Canada, it's 51, 52. Uh, so the U.S. and Canada have had about an equal decline, U.S. a little bit more. And if you think about it, you know, that begs the question, well, um, where are the residuals going? It used to be that you'd make lumber, the residuals would go to the newsprint, you'd get a nice chunk of income on your chip residuals. If this, and in some ways, you could think of lumber as kind of just an ancillary um, byproduct of the papermaking process. Well, going forward, that's the $64,000 question, is where are the chips going? Biomass? Well, Probably not for a variety of reasons. Um, the biomass with natural gas prices low, European ardor has kind of waned. And even if they do go to biomass, you get much less money for your chips than you used to. And there are a couple of alternative uses that we've seen. So this is a huge question going forward for the, the North American supply demand balance. Um, in the U.S., uh, you know, we, we, it's a little bit of a different story. There, there is more fiber available, particularly in the south. So Going forward, we see a lot of, if the blue is the south, you can see we expect um, production to go above peak harvest levels because there's so much wood being stored in the stump. Less so in the west because they had that outlet to China. So uh, just looking at kind of that, that's, that inventory uh, in the south, it's kind of a similar story in the west, but not as much. We have um, the saw timber inventories that red line there, it's basically, it grows when growth, excuse me, when drain is, uh, excuse me, when growth exceeds drain, harvested. So you can see that that whole uh, brownish gold area represents uh, inventory being built on the stump. Helps explain why we've seen so many Canadian producers buying up uh, lumber mills in the south. That's where the fiber is going to be. That's, that's a huge issue. Um, so we have this increase in, in prices, uh, excuse me, consumption going forward. And the question is, well, uh, where is it going to come from? How, how are we going to meet that? So if we look at over the next five years, you know, most of that, that, that increase in, in production is going to come from um, more production in North America. Part of it is going to come from imports, and mostly from Western Europe with some from South America, and then part of it's going to come from a reduction in exports. We, s we do see weaker growth in the Chinese markets. And even if prices come back as we expect them to do, a lot of Chinese demand will be priced out anyway. Um, similar story over the next 10-year horizon with 
uh, you know, th that import story really being filled by, in addition to Western Europe and South America, Russia, we see being a player in the ten, more in the 10-year the horizon. So uh, longer term, uh, if we just kind of tie up what we've been talking about here, um, well, we have demand going up, we have capacity being relatively constrained, at least the higher demand capacity ratios. And you know, if you map those out, it's a nonlinear relationship. Once you get up to about 9%, you, you start getting pretty high lumber prices, pretty healthy lumber prices. So uh, long term, the housing outlook's great. The lumber out outlook is great in terms of pricing if you're a producer, not a buyer. And, uh, but it's getting there. That's the issue. It's going to be a bumpy road. So um, before I conclude, um, I'll, I'll make a couple comments about the trade dispute because I know that Ian's going to ask me, uh, but, not, but not too many. Um, you know, our forecast assumes basically, so we're in a period now where we're in the so-called cool-off period. We don't think much is going to happen. That cool-off period ends in October. We don't anticipating much happening um, prior to October, I mean, it's just, you know, you get two groups of lawyers together, and <laughs> nothing happens till the end, so nothing's going to happen uh, near term. Well, we don't think it will, anyway. Um, we know the U.S. side is asking for quotas, the, um, the Canadian side is basically content with the status quo, is our understanding, and our base forecast assumes that we're going to have some version of, of the current system with probably some lower trigger prices. That's our base assumption. Um, as I said, the, the election results could obviously have a big impact on this, but um, well that's, it's too speculative at this point to say. So at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has. Identify yourself too, please. Uh, Mike Lisnowski, I'm a futures trader in Chicago. Um, you had a slide up there about the short-term inventory in the system. Right. How does one measure the short-term inventory? Uh, well, you, did, like, if you were talking about you think prices are going to decline in April. Right. You said, so inventory has exceeded demand consumption. Right. How do you measure the short-term? So we look at we look at shipments and consumption. My colleague does this. So this. I don't know the uh, the mechanics of it, okay. so I can. So it's not a public. <coughs> it's not publicly available. It's it's calculated by Paul Yankee, our, our lumber analyst, and he's looking at uh, shipment data and, and consumption data to, to, to make that calculation. Right. We, we've been, uh, particular, let's um, talk about steel. Um, we've, been <laughs> we've been addressing that threat since the early 90s. One of the issues um, um, is with steel is that, um, you know, the, the contractor base just hasn't <coughs> adapted. It's, gonna, it, it's been a very, very slow process, and it actually hasn't really happened uh, on the contractor side. So if you can't get the builders and contractors to use it, um, it it's... it's it's going to be a, a tough road for steel. And then, you know, um, we do think that uh, from a relative price standpoint, steel will be more competitive, though, because uh, China really drives the steel market much more so than it does the wood market, and we expect weaker growth in China. But, um, you know, we, 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 we just haven't, we, we, we assume that the steel isn't going to be a huge issue. Uh, concrete's more non res, you don't see too much in res. When, when we, we get a ton, we, whenever the market's turned down, we get a ton of interest in non-res uh, as, as a potential outlet for wood. And as soon as the residential markets come back, that interest tends to wane. So um, you know, we, we, we're not a huge 
uh, believer that, that non-res right now accounts for about 4 or 5% of North American lumber use, and we don't, we don't see it increasing much more than that. So I hope, hope that answers your question. Right, they are more credit constrained, and that, that's one of the things that's keeping them in, uh, in, in the parents' homes. There are a couple other issues, too. Is, um, uh, one is, is that the real trigger for single family, there's two main triggers for sing, to, to buy a single family home. One is marriage. The other is uh, birth of the first child. And both of those things have been pushed out by about four years, and that's, that's a trend. That's a long-term trend. That's not cyclical. So um, you know we we you know we might start moderating that 25 to 34 cohort to you know 30 or 28 to 37 or something like that. So um, interestingly, the the people who got hurt most during the, people say, oh, these these millennials don't want to buy. Surveys show they do, and they're not the ones who got burned by the housing downturn. It's more the generation above them that get burned. Student loan debt is is uh, in our view overrated. One, the parents own a lot of the debt, <laughs> not the students. Um, two, you know, 70, some are 73% owe 25000 or less. So um, that's, that's manageable at today's interest rates. It's not desirable, but it's manageable. It pushes back the date when you move out of your parents' home, but it doesn't completely eliminate it. I mean, the fear, the downside risk is that the you know, U.S. turns into Europe, particularly <laughs> Southern Europe where folks live at home longer, and it's a cultural norm. <coughs> so, mm. You had a chart on there earlier in the presentation that showed the ratio of multifamily to single family. Right. Uh, it, it left real quick, so I didn't get to see uh -huh. it. Uh, is, is multifamily expected to remain at a very relative level? Or is it yeah, we, it's, it's been high the last few years just on, in terms of levels. Mm -hmm. It's back kind of where it was in the 70s. Okay. We're back. There is no housing. We're back to underlying demand with, with multifamilies. Uh, we expect it to, 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 to increase from that level, but, but very gradually. Um, you know, the thing with multifamilies, it, it, it's uh, um, as we start to see uh, the, these millennials get older, there's going to be increased demand for single families, plus it's where they're being built. This whole issue of uh, the more homes that you see built in the south, uh, the, the less will be single family, uh, uh, multifamilies. So, like, for some perspective, New York has about 20 million people. Okay, what we do is we, we look at a single-family equivalent. We take single-family homes plus one-third of multi-homes, and that's a single-family uh, equivalent. That's how Wood Guy looks at it. North Carolina, with less than 10 million people, produces more single-family equivalent than does New York with 20 million people. So it's where the homes are being built that, that's crucial. New York had 85,000 multi-families. Yeah. Yeah, it's really volatile. They, they've had some. They've had some crazy volatile months. Uh, New York State. So, just but on a on a trend on a trend basis, uh, they're still very high in the, in the multifamily. In the upstate New York's depressed. Downstate's doing pretty well. It's dense. Right. 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 Uh, you know, we talk mid rise and then yep. higher. We talk about hybrid construction. Yeah, is, is this a potential? Uh, it, it is in certain parts of, of the U.S., but again, it's, I mean, just think uh, geometrically, right? So if you're in the either coast, you can only build in semicircles, and they're pretty built out. Yeah, yeah. But the fact is that people are moving south and they're moving to inland west, fewer, much fewer land constraints. The land constraints are lots and permitting kind of red tape issues. Uh, in those in those areas, so within California, within you know, Seattle area, um, you know, New York, Boston, the, these areas, I, I think this trend towards building up, I think there is something to that. Another thing, in the uh, for folks uh, who aren't from the U.S., um, uh, 
the way the U.S. funds education really uh, lends itself to its strongest single-family homes. Uh, pro the primary mechanism for funding schools is property taxes. So if you're a town, generally speaking, the better school districts are in, are in places with detached housing. So if you're a town and, and a builder comes in and says, I'm going to build 10 high-rises and we're going to send a bunch of kids to your school, your educational liability vastly exceeds your property tax, projected property tax income, and they'll, you'll come up with a m multitude of reasons not to let the f folks do that. And this is an issue. Brenda, we had a question over here. Hi, I'm uh, Ralph Spans. Yesterday we saw a very different uh, U.S. housing forecast. Uh -huh. uh, do you have any thoughts uh, that... Uh, what we can use to help evaluate the differences between the U.S. housing forecasts. Okay, I, I don't know what that one was. I wasn't here yesterday. So. It was uh, basically uh, 2016, 2017, flat, uh, very low growth in the U.S. housing market. Okay. Um, again, uh, a lot of it comes down to what's your viewpoint on where the economy is going. So if, if that forecast is put together, with the assumption of a U.S. recession or, or near recession, uh, that would make more sense. Um, uh, if we're, but if we're looking at that 2.5% growth, we're looking at improved uh, labor markets, and we do have this pent-up demand, I, I, I think I would lean towards, towards our, our stronger forecast. I know there was a gentleman here last year talking about 1.6 million for last year. So we, we haven't been there. So uh, I know it's... it's being in your position, it, it, it's, it can be difficult to go from you know, a million, 1.1 to 1.25 to 1.6. A lot of it, we ask that you look at some of the, these underlying fundamentals. What do you expect to happen with economic growth, employment growth, and um, wage growth? If those things are, are generally strong, uh, you know, I think that, that, that undersupply of housing really pushes towards an upward trajectory. Okay. Be around for a while. We'll I'll be around for, yeah. People okay. can interact later, but we oh. have a little gift for you. And oh, I'm excellent. I'm going to ask Frederick Bouchard, who is the partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers, to come you. up Thank and you. present this to you. Oh, wonderful. There you go. Thank you. Uh, a real taste of uh, Montreal. All right.